Hello everyone, welcome to the 36th lecture in the course Design and Engineering of Computer Systems. This week in this last week of the course, we are going to study more on the topic of reliability. Okay, so, let us get started. So, the topic of this week and uh, beginning with this lecture is fault tolerance and reliability. So, let us uh, spend some time trying to understand what these words mean and what is reliability and what is fault tolerance. So, all computer systems they are not perfect you know nothing in life is perfect. Similarly, computer systems also they have various kinds of faults or errors from time to time you know. So, these can be hardware faults like your hardware stops working, your uh, you know hard disk crashes, they can be software faults you know there is some bug in your code, some implementation design issue, some configuration errors you did not configure it properly. Then while the system is running at operational time there could be faults like you know the power fails, network fails as a security attack. So, there are many kinds of things that can go wrong, many kinds of faults in a computer system. And these faults can be transient that is they happen only briefly go away, they keep on happening intermittently or they can happen permanently cause permanent damage whatever it is there are many things that can go wrong. And most of these faults they might go unnoticed and you know you may not even notice that the fault has happened everything is as uh, usual going on as usual. But sometimes these faults cause failures or errors which are noticed by others noticed by the users of the system you know you try to access a ticket reservation uh, website it does not work that is a failure that the users perceive ok. And these failures are also many types you know when your system fails it can completely stop upon failing those are called fail stop failures. The other mode is the system fails but it still continues to work in some sort of a you know minimal safe state it will continue to work those are called fail safe systems or you know the worst kind is your system fails there is some failure error and your system starts acting weird malicious after the failure those are Byzantine failures ok. So, whatever it is all of these failures they will be noticed by the users of the system and uh, you know that is what we want to avoid. So, fault tolerance is you know a way in which you can design systems such that you can mask these faults whatever faults are there in real life that are inevitable you will somehow design around them so that they can be masked they can become harmless and it will not become a failure or something that the end users of a system notices right. So, the goal here is not to completely get rid of faults that will not happen you know that is the nature of the world that faults will keep happening. The goal here is only that we try to somehow hide these faults so that they do not result in some failures or errors that others will notice. So, this week we are going to see various techniques by which we can make systems robust to faults and therefore make them more reliable ok. So, before we try to see the techniques let us try and understand how do you measure reliability you know if you can measure something then you can say oh my reliability is getting better it is getting worse and so on. So, there are a few metrics using which we can quantify measure the reliability of a system. One is the mean time to failure you know between the your system is working fine for all this time then it fails then you repair it it again is working fine then it fails again. So, the average of these durations you know the time between successive failures of a system that is called the mean time to failure. Obviously, you want this to be as long as big as possible. Then the next uh, metric is mean time to recovery. That is once your system fails you know you do some steps to fix the failure and then it starts to run again you know. The average of these durations where your system is down getting repaired and then it recovers and runs again you know this average of these durations that is the mean time to recovery. And you want this to be as low as possible you know you want your system to fail very rarely and whenever it fails you want it to kind of uh, you know recover or get repaired as quickly as possible. So, there is a metric that captures all of these behaviors of a system that is called the availability or the uptime which is the fraction of time the component is running and this is approximately you know the duration between failures divided by the total duration which is the duration uh, between failures as well as the time taken to repair 
Okay. So, this is the availability definition and of course, 1 minus uh, this uptime is the downtime of your system. Right. So, this uptime or downtime measure what fraction of the time your system is running and what fraction of time it is kind of you know down and it is being repaired. There is also another way to measure availability which is you know this is the colloquial uh, number definition that you see which is in terms of number of 9s. Okay. If your system has 99.99% availability this is called 4 9s of availability. 99 percent availability is 2 9s of availability like that you know the number of 9s that are there in the availability that is said to be a common way of quantifying your availability of the system. So, what does this mean 4 9s of availability means that you know your system is only down for point you know 0 1 percent of the time it is down right that is a very small uh, fraction of time. For example, in a day you have so many seconds in a day so maximum of you know 8 seconds during the day your system can be down. Anything more than this it will not have 4 9s of availability. So, in this way you know when people build system they say oh my system has 4 9s, 5 9s, 6 9s of availability and so on right. So, these are ways in which you quantify how available or how reliable your system is. So, now let us uh, broadly look at what are some of the techniques for fault tolerance. So, the techniques fall under two broad uh, categories first is of course, detecting when failures or errors occur and the other is recovering from these failures or errors right. So, the techniques that we are going to discuss in today's lecture fall under these two buckets roughly. So, how do you detect when a failure has occurred. So, some of these we have seen before for example, in the case of you know transport protocols like TCP, TCP sender is sending many segments and each segment has a sequence number you know 1, 2, 3 whatever they are actually byte based sequence numbers, but uh, you get the idea. So, every uh, segment has a sequence number. So, when the receiver gets segment 1 and then the receiver gets segment 3 then the receiver knows oh something in between here is lost. Okay, so, you can use sequence numbers and acknowledgements to detect packet losses in networking transport protocols. There are also other ways which is you can add some additional bits like you know CRC or checksum a few additional bits here is your packet and some additional bits like the checksum or CRC are added to a packet or to any data that is stored on you know hard disks or DVDs or CDs you know any time you store some data you add some additional bits. And these bits are useful to detect errors. For example, after some time you recompute these bits again when a network packet is received or when you read some data from a DVD, you recompute this bits again. If it does not match, it means that something is wrong, some bit here is corrupted that is why the CRC or checksum is not matching. So, this is one way to detect errors. Another way is you know if you have a multi-tier system, you have multiple components in a system all of which are you know talking to each other exchanging messages then you can do something like send heartbeat messages periodically. You know all the components in your system periodically keep uh, saying hello, hello, hello to each other. And if you do not hear from somebody for a very long time then you start to worry maybe you know that component has failed. So, these are some of the techniques to detect errors when failures happen in a system. The first step to fix a failure is of course, to detect it. So, these are the error detection techniques. Then the next step is to actually recover from the error you know to make the fault or the error go away. So, what are the error recovery techniques again some of this uh, we have seen, but the basic idea across all of this is to add redundancy into the system. You know of course, bad things keep happening. So, you just have a little bit of extra slack into your system so that you can recover from these bad things. For example, again in the case of TCP you have retransmissions whenever the sender you know realizes that a packet is uh, lost then the sender will resend retransmit this uh, packet. So, that the end to end application layer does not perceive this fault at all as far as you know your uh, if you are browsing a web page it is not like you see a hole in uh, some part of your web page you know that error is recovered even if the packet is lost once the TCP sender will resend it again and you will see the complete web page or you will see a complete file that you have downloaded. In this way transport layer protocols like TCP they mask these network losses network packet losses and recover these errors. So, retransmission is one way of adding redundancy into the system 
there are also other ways you know when you send network packets or when you store data on uh, you know storage media like DVDs what you can do is you can add some additional redundant bits these are called error correcting codes you know instead of storing these bits you also add some extra bits so that together with all of these bits together you can recover any errors that may have happened ok. So, we will see what these are in a little bit and of course, uh, the final technique is replication you know of your system components or system data. For example, if some web server is prone to failures then what you do is you have two copies of the web server. So, that if this guy fails this uh, web server will handle the HTTP requests. In this way have multiple replicas or multiple uh, copies of your system components or data so that if one fails the other is still available right. So, these are broadly the techniques for fault tolerance. Now, some of these we will go into a little bit more detail in today's lecture. So, first is error detection and correction codes. Uh, so, this is a very vast topic on its own and if you take a networking course or an information theory course you are going to learn much more about it. Uh, in this one slide I will just briefly touch upon the idea so that you know the concept of what are error detection and correction codes ok. So, at a high level these are nothing but you add some additional bits to either messages that you send over the network or you know data you store on storage systems like hard disks and DVDs and you know wherever you store something or you send something instead of the original message alone you add some additional bits. So, that together these additional bits will help you detect or correct some errors ok. Any bit level corruption that happens in your message or your data you can detect it and sometimes you can even recover what the original data was even if a few bits have been corrupted. So, let us see some examples ok. One very simple error detection code is what is called adding a parity bit to your message. So, this parity bit uh, can be either an odd parity or an even parity. What does it mean? Suppose you are doing an even parity scheme. What you will do is at the end of your message you will add one extra bit to make the number of ones in your message even. Of course, if you are doing odd parity you will try to make the number of ones odd. Right. So, whatever it is uh, the basic idea is the same. For example, if your original message is these 3 bits 100 0, 0, the number of 1s is odd. So, you will add 1 extra 1. If your original message is 101 1, you do not need any more 1s. If you add another 1 the number of 1s uh, will become odd again which you do not want. So, therefore, you will add a 0. So, now whatever message you send it will always have an even number of 1s. So, that is called an even parity scheme. Now, how is this useful? Now, if you receive a message and the number of ones is odd, then you know that something is wrong. This is not suppose if you receive a message like 1011, then you know that the sender would never have sent something like this because the sender is doing an even parity scheme. Therefore, you know that ok this packet received or this data you read from the DVD, there is something wrong with it. You do not know what is wrong, but you know that something is wrong and therefore, you can ask for a retransmission or ignore this or whatever depends on the application. So, this is an example of an error detection mechanism. Then uh, even more complicated example is what are called repetition codes that is you repeat a bit multiple times so that you can be uh, more uh, stable if errors occur. For example, you might say instead of sending bit 0 I will send I will repeat each bit 3 times instead of sending 0 I will send 0 0 0 instead of sending 1 I will send 1 1 1 right. So, this is a simple repetition code and this this uh, 3 bits instead of this 1 bit is what you will transmit or you will store on persistent storage. Now, when you are doing this suppose 1 bit error occurs you know the 0 0 0 was corrupted to 0 0 1. Then you know because every bit is repeated 3 times you can look at this you can take like some majority vote and see that most likely this was actually 0 0 0 and 1 bit error has occurred. Therefore, if you know that one bit error has occurred then you say ok this is 0 0 0 there is no other option. So, not only have you detected the error you have said that this is wrong data you have also corrected it to the original data you have recovered the original data ok. So, this is how error correction can also happen. But of course, this would not happen all the time. So, suppose you know 2 bit errors have occurred and your 0 0 0 2 bits have flipped and it became 101. 
Now you know if you try to do error correction you will most likely say oh the original data is 111 but that is not correct you know your original data was 000. So depending on how many bit errors you expect to happen some codes can only detect errors whereas some codes can also detect as well as correct errors ok. You can detect a larger number of errors but you can correct only a smaller number of errors. So that depending on your probability of bit errors you can decide whether you want to you know be more aggressive and correct the errors or you want to be a little bit more conservative and only detect the errors. Okay, and this is of course a very simple uh, dumb example a repetition code there are in uh, reality there are many more efficient error correction codes you know each bit is being repeated 3 times this is so much waste of network bandwidth and all of that. But there are error correction codes which add very few extra bits but can detect and correct a large number of bit errors like for example the Hamming codes ok. So if you take a class on uh, networking or information theory you will learn lot more about all of these different types of error detection and correction codes. So this is uh, one technique to detect and correct errors. The other technique is what is called replication ok. So what is replication all of us intuitively understand what it is you know suppose you have a server uh, let us take our example of an e-commerce uh, website that we have been using all through the course you know you have an e-commerce website you have a front end and you have many application servers handling different uh, kinds of uh, requests you know for example there is a server that is maintaining the shopping cart of users ok. Whenever the user adds an item to the shopping cart that request is processed by the server and uh, whenever the user wants to view the cart this uh, server will return for that user the latest version of the user's shopping cart right. It processes user requests like adding, deleting, viewing items in a shopping cart. Now if this server you know it has handled a bunch of requests and then it has crashed a user has added 10 items to the shopping cart and the server crashes due to a power failure or whatever. Now when the user says fetch me my cart if the server restarts all the memory is erased then what will happen the server will basically show an empty cart to the user or the server is down some other server comes up uh, to be the shopping cart server and that guy says I do not know what all you did in the past but here is your empty cart. Right, that is not what we want I mean that is ridiculous to be doing something like that. Therefore what you need is in spite of failures you want the server to be able to show the correct data of the application and serve user requests correctly and the solution for that is replication. So instead of having one shopping cart server you will have multiple replicas of the shopping cart server and all of these together will be able to handle user requests and somehow be fault tolerant you know there is some redundancy built into your system instead of giving the job to one guy you give it to like 3 or 5 different guys so that somehow the job gets done ok. So the key idea is basically replication instead of doing it in one place do it at multiple server what are called replicas or copies of your server. So there are two broad ways in which you can do this replication one is what is called active active replication that is you have multiple replicas and all of these replicas are active replicas that is whenever a user request comes user says add an item to a shopping cart that uh, request goes to all the replicas and all of them will update their shopping cart when the user says view an item the request will go to all of them when the user says delete an item it will go to all of them ok. In this way all of these replicas are actively participating in this replication process and they are all handling all the requests and they are keeping the application state all the time. So there is of course this you might think this is wasteful but that is the whole point there is some redundancy in the system instead of one guy doing the job three guys are doing the same job or four guys or five guys how many ever replicas you decide to have ok. So that now you can see how this is a good idea right if one of these uh, replicas fails then you will stop sending requests to that uh, server you will send it to the other servers and they can return back the latest application state no data is lost. So this is active active replication. The other technique is active passive replication that is all the replicas are not actively handling uh, requests all the time. So all the user requests are sent to only one of the replicas ok which is the active replica. And this replica only handles the requests and maintains all the application state and this replica will periodically check point the state ok. Every so often it will store all the shopping carts of all the users somewhere say in some disk or something. And there is only one guy 
who is handling all the requests. And if this guy crashes, then there are a few other replicas on standby, you know, they are just on the side waiting and watching. They are not doing anything, they are not handling traffic all the time, but they are, you know, readily available. And if this replica crashes, then we will make one of these other passive replicas as the active replica. And this guy will read whatever information the active replica had stored, you know, information about all the shopping cards, this passive replica will become active, read all the state from persistent storage. And now it will start being the active replica and request will come here. So, until now this passive replica was on the sidelines, once the active replica dies, fails then the passive replica will become active and then it will start serving user requests and because it has taken all of the state from the active replica, it will continue to correctly serve user requests. You know when the user has added items to the previous active replica, this new active replica has read all of that state and it can correctly display the shopping cart of the user. So, these are two ways active, active and active passive replication. And across both of these, you should always remember that you should send the response back to the client only after replication has been completed. Whether it is active active or active passive, only after you store the state, only after the request is handled by all the active replicas, you are sure that there is redundancy in the system. Only then, you know the client sends a request, only then you will send a confirmation back to the client. Okay? Before your replication finishes, never send a confirmation back to the client. Why? Because if you do that and then your replication fails later on, then you already told the client, hey, I handled your request, but in reality his data is lost. You know, he added an item to the cart that is lost because you did not replicate it and if the server fails, then the data is lost. Instead, make sure the data is safe, make sure the data is replicated at multiple nodes or checkpointed, the state is stored somewhere and then send a reply to the client. So that even if you know a failure happens before you send a reply, then it is ok, the client will retry, the client will you know uh, repeat the operation. But once you give a confirmation to the client, the client thinks it is done, there should not be any failure in the system. So now let us understand this active active and active passive in a little bit more detail. So active active replication is also known as replicated state machines. Uh, what does this mean? So, you can think of all the replicas as uh, finite state machines, you know, they are maintaining some state of the system, some application state for example, a shopping cart each of these replicas is maintaining and whenever they get some input, you know, add an item or something, a request comes in, an input is received then the replicas go to a new state, okay, here the shopping cart was empty and you add an item then uh, one item comes up into the shopping cart, right. So, in this way the system has a certain state and then a request comes an input comes and then it goes to a new state. Okay, you can think of every application server like this as a finite state machine. Now with active active replication all of these state machines are maintained in sync, they are all replicated state machines. That is the same input is being given to all the replicas and they all start in the same state and therefore they will all end up in the same state. At any point of time they are all in lockstep, they are all in sync with each other. Because they start with the same state, they get the same inputs in the same order and therefore they will end up in the same state. Of course, you should ensure that there is no non-determinism in the system, you know, there is no randomness in uh, from one state to the other in going from one state to the other so that for the same inputs you reach the same end state. And this is the concept of replicated state machines and it is very important that all the replicas start with the same initial state, receive the same inputs in the same order and therefore end up in the same final state. The application state is always in sync across all the replicas. Then what happens upon failure? If there is a failure, one of the replicas fails, it is ok. The other replicas also have the same state. So they can any time instead of sending request to this replica, you start sending it to the other replicas. All of them are identical, so it does not matter who handles which request. Okay? So your failover, recovery from failure is quite fast. But of course, this is higher overhead because you have to always keep all the replicas in sync with each other. So how this is done, we will see a little bit later, you know, this week we are going to study techniques for how to do this, but uh, I hope the basic uh, concept is clear here. Then 
The other thing to note is even though all these replicas are uh, active and they are all doing the same work, they all may not have the same responsibility. There might be slight difference in responsibilities. For example, one of them can be usually what is called the primary replica or the leader, you know, that uh, leader might take more responsibility. For example, the leader might be coordinating this replication. And sometimes, you know, there are operations that should be done only once, you know. For example, if you have a server that is doing the checkout and billing users in an e-commerce website, you cannot say, oh, I have three replicas, therefore I will charge the user's credit card three times because all three of them are handling the request, you know, you cannot say that. So, among these multiple replicas, some of them might have different responsibilities and they are called like the master or the leader or the primary replica. But all of them are handling all inputs and they are all maintaining themselves in the same state with respect to the application. So, the next is active passive replication, okay. This is also called logging and checkpointing. So, there is only one active replica which gets all the user's requests, handles all the requests and periodically this replica will checkpoint all the state of the application. So, this is the active replica. Okay, so, what will you save? You can either save all the inputs that you get, you know, uh, if you are maintaining a shopping cart, all the requests to add, delete items into the shopping cart you can store or you can just store the final application state, you know, after all of these requests here is my shopping cart, you can store the final answer or you can store all the intermediate steps also. Both these are valid ways of checkpointing, but usually if you are logging all inputs that is a little bit more work than just you know checkpointing the final state. So, usually some combination of this is used you know periodically you will checkpoint the final state and along with this final state maybe you will also keep a log of uh, intermediate inputs. So, you might do some combination of all of this you know log a few inputs then after some time instead of all of this log here is the final state then again log some inputs or oh, here is the summarized final state you can keep doing that. And uh, sometimes what you can do is you can also checkpoint the complete memory of a system. Like if your server is running inside a VM, you checkpoint the all the memory of the VM periodically. So, this will give you full system replication. Instead of just replicating the application data or the application server, you replicate the entire memory of a VM so that all the applications, all the processes, everything in it is checkpointed. That is also possible. So, whatever you do the active replica is basically either logging all the inputs or periodically checkpointing the entire application state just the summary of processing all of these inputs either one of these two it will keep doing. Now, when this replica fails you have a few passive replicas on standby one of them will decide key I will become uh, the active replica. So, this uh, passive replica will take over and become active request start going to this passive replica. But before that what this passive replica will do is it will read all this checkpointed state, it will update itself with whatever has happened in the past, it will read the checkpointed state, it will replay these log inputs you know add item, delete item, it will process all of those. So, that it will come up to date with the application state and then it will start to accept user request. Now, it is ready, it has become active. So, you can see that there is a longer time for recovery as compared to active active replication because you have to do a little bit more work before you become active. And the other important thing is you know all these uh, checkpoints, these logs, all of these things have to be stored in some persistent storage, some safe storage. You cannot say oh I checkpointed it, but that log that checkpoint is information is lost because a hard disk failed, you know. That has to be stored in some fault tolerant data store, you know you might use a remote data store, something else, uh, some key value store or something that is present in uh, some other location and that data store may also use replication. Whatever it is you have to make sure this these checkpoints are stored somewhere safely that is accessible to both the active and passive replicas. So, that uh, the active replica can keep writing these things and the passive replica can read them when it is its turn to become active. And now briefly to summarize, how do you recover from failures, how do you achieve fault tolerance? So, first there are multiple uh, replicas in your uh, system, each server is not implemented as one entity, but as multiple replicas and these replicas keep using messages like heartbeats, uh, you know they keep periodically sending messages to each other to see who is alive, who is not and so on. And if uh, replica 
or you know there is a load balancer that is distributing traffic to all of these replicas, this load balancer keeps monitoring. So, everybody keeps monitoring each other and when a failure is discovered then you will do a failover procedure, you know if it is active active you will stop using the failed replica and you will redirect traffic to the other active replicas. If it is active passive then you know your failover mechanism will start this passive replica will you know restore the state from checkpoint, replay logs, it will catch up and start behaving like the active replica. So, all of this you detect a failure and you run this failover procedure, this recovery procedure. And all of these should make sure that as far as the users or the clients of a system are concerned for them any correctness is not violated. You know any request for which a user has uh, sent a request and you have sent a confirmation back those requests are replicated safely in the system. You are sending a confirmation back only after replication. So, therefore, for those requests you should not see any impact of the failure. Why? Because you have replicated it you can recover that state. But suppose the user sent a request and the active replica was in the middle of processing that request and it did not replicate and it failed. Then the user will not get a response back, the user will retry the next time you will handle that request. So, you should always ensure that anything that you send a confirmation back to the user is replicated properly can be recovered and anything for which you did not send a confirmation back that is ok, you are in the middle of replication it did not complete that is ok because the user will retry once again in the future ok. So, this has to be kept in mind at the end user it should never be the case that the end user has sent a request to you, you said oh I handled the request you sent a confirmation back and then later on you say oh no I lost the data due to some failure at my end that is not acceptable. So, now there are certain challenges with doing this replication it is not as uh, straightforward ok. So, what are uh, these uh, challenges? One thing is of course what is called consistency that is you know all of these uh, replicas the fact that there are multiple copies of the data multiple replicas of the server all of this should be transparent to the end user the end user should not realize any of these things. So, all these replicas should somehow act as one there should be consistency in the system you know all the input should be replayed correctly at all the active replicas, the check pointing of the state should happen correctly, all the replicas should agree on you know who will take over when the active replica fails. So, there should be some agreement or consistency or consensus across all the replicas. It is not that one replica thinks your shopping cart has 5 items, the other thinks your shopping cart has 6 items that should never happen. So, consistency that is an important thing and the other thing important property is atomicity. That is if a set of actions are happening they should appear like one unit to the end user. It should not be that you did half an action and you did not do the other half of the action due, due to a failure. For example, if uh, you know the user says check out a particular purchase, the user has placed an order and says check out. Then this check out server will you know uh, do the payment and then it will do the shipping. So, you should either do both you know you should collect the user's payment and then ship the product or if the failure has happened you do not do anything and then the user will check out again. But you should never do half and half, you should never you know charge the user's credit card but then say oh no a failure happened I forgot to ship the product to you, that is not acceptable ok. So, in spite of failures you should ensure consistency across all your replicas and you should ensure atomicity within the processing of each replica. So, in the next uh, couple of lectures we are going to see how we are going to achieve all of these things. So, that is all I have for uh, today's lecture. In today's lecture we have studied the basic concept of fault tolerance, we have seen what is availability, then we have seen the techniques for fault tolerance like uh, replication you know active 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 passive replication and so on. And we have said that there are some challenges to doing this uh, replication which is consistency and atomicity. So, in the next couple of lectures we are going to see how these challenges are solved in real systems. But before uh, I tell you the answers I would like you to think about you know this is these are sort of uh, you know common problems that in your day to day life you know you want to store the same item in three different places. How do you ensure the three copies are consistent? You know think about what some of these solutions are when servers are failing. Of course, if all replicas are running all the time consistency is easy you store the same data at three places it is done. But what if a replica fails it missed adding an item to the cart because it failed and now you know the shopping cart there is inconsistent with the other shopping carts right. In such situations what do you do? How do you ensure consistency? How do you ensure atomicity? So, please think through some of these solutions yourself 
and in the next lecture we are going to discuss the answers. Thank you all that is all I have for uh, this lecture and uh, let us continue this discussion in the next lecture. Thanks.